I would like to get started. And a big welcome today to Kirsten Wirt. And she is from the Walking Council of Governments. And I was going to ask you before we started where you got your undergraduate degree. At Dickinson College. Oh! Pennsylvania. Carlisle, Pennsylvania. We've mm -hmm. got a Dickinson <laughs> College graduate. I taught it at uh, uh, Gettysburg College. Oh, okay. Yeah. Close by. Close, Close by. by. And what did you major in? Anthropology. Anthropology, perfect. <laughs> and here we are. Here, here we, we are. are. Talking about smart transportation. So she's got a lot of information. I'm not going to take her time. I'll just say, on behalf of Hexley College, you're welcome. And Thank welcome you. Kirsten. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much. And just have a, a big round of applause, not only for Kirsten, our speaker today, but Stephanie. And our videographer. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So I think there might have been two people in the back that didn't get a map. Is there? You didn't get one. So um, I have to admit, I wasn't quite sure exactly what. My, or Richard, you got a map. Somebody else didn't, I thought. Here. You, oh, there you go. OK. So I coordinate the Smart Trips program for Whatcom County um, from the Whatcom Council of Governments. And the program is for anyone in Whatcom County uh, to, in, we encourage people to get out of their cars and make more active transportation trips. Um, how many people here are members of Smart Trips? Got one. Any of you guys have, you haven't heard of it before then? Okay. How long have you guys been in at Western? Are you, what year are you? For two, three, you've been in Bellingham for a few years? Okay. So, and how many people own a bicycle? Half? How many people have a bus pass? Every, is that everyone? Everyone here has a bus pass? Okay, you don't need to take these then. All right, and everybody has two feet, right? <laughs> So um, we're going to talk about bus, bike, and walk. Um, carpool also, how many people came to campus with a car? Have a car here. Two? So not too many. So that actually is the reason that you probably haven't heard too much about Smart Trips. We don't spend a lot of our um, marketing dollars up at Western because of the high parking fees you guys would have to pay, the fact that I don't think you're supposed to bring a car as a freshman, correct? Is that? Am I right with that? Um, so, you know, we're, our marketing dollars are better spent out in the community with people who are driving and trying to get them to leave their cars in the driveway. So, um, this is what the website looks like right now. Um, only one of you would know that we got hacked on August 1st and we lost our whole website. We didn't lose our data. We lost one month of data. Um, but we had to build a new website from the ground up and they did it in 20 days. Our web team was awesome. Uh, we were going to rebuild our website by the end of this year because at six, almost seven years old, we knew it was getting old and was vulnerable to getting, it was, uh, they think it was a robo hack that it just, a robot that goes out and tries to mine information, um, but it didn't look like any information was taken from our website, which is really good. But they inserted SQL code into the website and it just ate it up from the inside out. So really expensive thing to have happen. So somebody should be setting up insurance for that, I think. <laughs> but um, anyway, this is what the new website looks like for now. We haven't um, had our designer go through it yet. Uh, but you go, go to our website, you, sign in, create a trip calendar, and the whole idea is to make people more aware of the trips that they're making, the smart trips they're making, and encourage them to make more trips. A uh, smart trip is any trip you make that is not alone in the car. So anytime you bus, bike, walk, or ride share. So the calendar looks like this. Um, right now, this is my calendar today. I've made 1,500, I'm um, almost 1,600 trips, 1,587 trips. And that's in just under six years of logging my trips. And I live over by Barkley. Um, I work downtown. It's about a 2.2 mile bike ride. I bike every day to work. You can do an auto fill on your calendar. So all it does is fill in. I make this trip every weekday. So I definitely do that. I bike a lot more than that, but that's often what I fill in on my calendar. 
And in six years of doing that, I've logged over 11,000 miles. So it's these short little trips that we're likely to jump in our car and make that our program is really trying to target. So the, the trip in 40% um, of the trips in the US, and this definitely holds for Bellingham and Whatcom County, 40% of the trips that we drive are less than two miles. So kind of sad when you think you can bike two miles in about 15 minutes. That's a 15 minute bike ride isn't a big deal, but it's just so much easier to grab the car keys. Um, we're just in such a car centric culture. So the, the short trips really add up is where I'm going with that. When you log your trips, you've got, um, you put in your one way distance um, and then you put in your trip mode. I don't have a pointer on this. But I had, I was trying to get a screenshot with the drop downs open, but it wouldn't, I couldn't manage that. So it's bus, bike, walk, or carpool. Those are your four trip mode options. And then um, your trip purpose can be work, school, leisure, or errands. So it pretty much covers any trip you're making for any purpose. And that's what really makes our program a lot different. There's a lot of commute trip reduction programs across the country. Um, almost any other program you look at anywhere else in the U.S. is really focused on the commute trip. That's the, it's, it's called CTR, commute trip reduction. And what we know from our mobility studies um, in Bellingham is that the commute trip is only 20% of the trips on the road in any given day. So if all you're focusing on is a commute trip and you're only working at businesses, then you're only going to get 20% of the traffic on the road. So if your goal truly is to reduce traffic, get cars off the road, get people making healthy active trips, then concentrating on the work trip, while it's convenient because you have people clumped in big groups at work sites, you can work with them easily, it's not the most effective way to actually get cars off the road. So our program is really unique in that we include all people in Whatcom County, any kind of trip they're making, and it doesn't matter where you work. Um, and then we have incentives. So the incentives, if you log five trips for the month, you're automatically in a $250 prize drawing. If you make five trips each month of the quarter, you're automatically in a $1,000 prize drawing. And these are some of our winners. Um, the last quarter's $1,000 prize winner at the top, and then just uh, this past month, um, that's our $250 prize winner. I just took a picture of our new $1,000 prize winner uh, today, and she was quite happy. <laughs> that's my favorite part of my job, is giving away the $1,000 and the $250. But um, we put their, post them up on the, the website. And then every 100 trips, we give people a milestone reward. So every 100 trips that you log, uh, we give you the first one's a double scoop of ice cream at Mallard's or a t-shirt, third one's a half dozen bagels at the Bagelry. There's eight different prizes we have or gifts. I mean, it's a thank you gift for making the smart trips. Um, and those really keep people logging trips. It's amazing how long some people have logged their trips and amazing commuters or car people on the bus and carpoolers that are going 25, 30 miles a day, how quickly their miles add up. It's really amazing. And on this website, um, we will have the miles back up there. We used to put the miles right up how, how many miles you've kept off the roads. Um, we have some more work to do on the website, but we've got to be able to run our report. So. Richard, if you haven't gotten a milestone reward from us in, and you've been logging your trips, we haven't mailed any out since the website got hacked in August. So we're, we're, by the end of this month, they're supposed to have the report. We just literally can't pull the names and print the envelopes. We have all the data, but we can't run the reports um, right now, today. Hopefully next week. <laughs> we have a lot of mail to get out next week, that's for sure. So, um, ooh, it went backwards. Why am I going backwards now? Was it? It should just go. Mm. Maybe I'll we'll have to be more manual on this. So we've got the milestones. So I'll just quickly go through the three, well, four modes, walk, bike, bus, carpool. Um, this was supposed to be the ins and outs of getting around Bellingham. So I want you guys all to open your maps 
Did everybody get a, get a map? I think a few people came in. Anybody not get a map in the back? Um, and I didn't hand these out just because they're a little more difficult. Here, take one of these. Open up your map and this is something that people really just don't have a clue about is how close things actually are. I want you to find your house on the map. Is everybody here in Bellingham? No, you're out in the county? Um, then you're not going to be on the map. So do use the school as your center point. Or if you work in town, or probably Western's good. And everybody get oriented with the map. an awesome map of Bellingham. The reason it's awesome is that it's not, um, it's more a pedestrian map. Sorry. Probably never supposed to see that one. I'll see one time. Um, it's a pedestrian map of Bellingham, so the arterials are a lot harder to find. You know, you look for Alabama on there and you don't see it. If you're looking for an arterial, look for the pink bus line. But if you look at this map, the teal roads, the teal blue, are an awesome light like, route. lines, that's going to be the um, bus routes. And if you look at the solid green are trails that are bikeable. The dotted green are trails that are walkable. They have stairs or they're steeper. They're not really suitable to riding your bike on. So this really is a pedestrian map versus a car map. And what I want you to do, put that circle on your, on your house. Did you get a circle? Um, and this is a one mile radius. So everything within under that plastic is within one mile of your house. So how many people see something within that one mile that they've driven to? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing when you really look at the scale of things and you really look at how small Bellingham is. That's a seven minute bike ride if you're kind of put, you know, putting along. Um, that's a 20 minute walk to the edge of that if you're not you know, some people can walk a mile in 15 minutes. Um, but look at some of the other places you might be going. What I do, I actually take this into um, seventh grade classrooms and I have them put a different colored dot, one on their house, one on their school, one on their best friend's house, one on the grocery store that their parents mostly go to, and one on one other favorite place. And I have them figure out on a worksheet if it takes you 20 minutes to walk a mile and seven minutes to bike a mile, how long does it take you to bike to your friend's house? And these, these are places where these kids have been driven their whole life. They're 12, 13 years old. And they're shocked. They're like, you mean I could bike to my friend's house in six minutes? And I'm like, yes, tell your parents you want to bike next time. Don't be driven all these places. So um, in the US, generally speaking, adults overestimate the time they think it will take them to walk or take the bus or bicycle someplace by 50%. They overestimate that. But they underestimate how long it takes them to drive someplace by 10%. So as a culture, we really have this view that cars are the best way to go, that fast is the way to go, that you know, the car fast and efficient. But sometimes a bicycle, you know, if you get exercise in your routine, um, making active transportation trips are really a great way to go. And what studies have found is that um, walking is the first trip that people change. So there's a lot of places that you go that are within that mile that are pretty close. And when people first start trying to add more smart trips into their day, walking is the first thing they do. So. Um, walking trips are great. You can enter in a trip as short as you want on our website. We're not picky about that. It can be 0.2 miles and we don't mind. Put it in. And keeping that calendar um, really helps people start thinking about the trips they're making and trying to add more in. So um, the bus. So we have the WTA bus system. You guys, do you guys all ride the bus? Because I don't need to talk about it too much then. Everybody here pretty much rides the bus. Go ahead. Okay, so 
what I talk about when I go out to encourage other people, um, and this could be a way of looking at this talk as well, which I wasn't sure if I was just going to be talking about how to encourage others or how to encourage you guys. Um, I really, I go through um, and give them bus basics. It's amazing. People don't know how much the bus costs. They don't know where you put your money in. They don't know that you, I always point out, look, no change given. If you put a five in there, your bus trip just costs five bucks. And a lot of people out in the community don't realize that. Um, so I also set up, for smart trips, I also set up the um, employer partners. So I go out to employers and work with them and help them figure out ways to encourage more of their employees to um, not drive to work. Uh, so we talk about the bus, we talk about um, the fares. I have with me, and this is, always goes over really well with the seventh graders, but I give them all a transit guide and then I give them each two one free ride coupons. And um, they're challenged by their teacher to ride the bus someplace that weekend or go with a parent. Um, and I always have to show them, put it in the dollar bill slot and it'll take it in. So I always have that slide in my presentations. Um, I just finished up, yesterday was my last day with Kulshan Middle School and um, the School Smart Trips program that we wrote, uh, we're, this was our first full launch of it and I was in there Mondays and Thursdays all day for five weeks. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, pretty intense, but um, these kids got a lot out of it. So the first class I teach them, uh, we do a transportation jeopardy game, which is really quite fun. They really enjoy that. They ring bike bells to sound off that they want to answer the question. And the second class, we do mapping. We do this with the plastic disc. I told you about that. And the third class, they learn about reading the WTA transit guide which is tough, you know, that's like, a, you open that up, it's a sea of numbers. That's really confusing for kids that have never seen this before. It's really confusing for a lot of adults when I go and talk at businesses about smart trips. Um, and then the last class is about riding the bike. So um, those classes, they're, they're really fun to do. Um, I remind everybody that we do have lines that run every 15 minutes. You guys have excellent bus service up here at Western. Um, we really do have pretty amazing bus service for a city the size of Bellingham in the U.S. Uh, you know, you can't compare to Asian countries or, you know, a lot of other European places. But um, we do have really pretty amazing bus service overall. Um, and I always point out you can put your bike on the bus. And that's something that a lot of people don't think about. Um, they live far from a bus stop and so just assume I can't take the bus. And that's too bad because they really can. You know, if, even if you live a mile from a bus stop, that might be a 20 minute walk that you don't want to take the time to do. But you could zip down in your bike in seven minutes, lock your bike. If it's a safe place, you could lock your bike at the bus stop or put your bike on the bus. And has anybody done that here? Who in this room has put their bike on the bus? One, two, three, four. Richard, you have? So, so if you're going to put your bike on the bus, it is a little bit intimidating the first time. And I've been trying to get WTA to paint a mural on the wall and have a rack so people could try it out before they're actually at a bus stop with the bus coming up. Um, you uh, put your tires in the correct grooves of the rack. Um, the, the tires are, the rack is marked to put your front tire here. Um, and then you pull up this arm that comes up over your front tire. And it's just a spring-loaded hook. There's nothing fancy about it. There's no clips. The first time I did it, I was sure my bike was going to fall off the bus <laughs> and get run over by the bus. But it holds it on. It works. Um, and then uh, when you want to take your bike off, this is a better shot of the arm coming up to the front right at the bottom there. You can see the arm on one of the racks. Um, undo the arm off your bike pick your bike up, and then be sure you fold it up. So uh, there's a handle that says um, squeeze here to fold. I think it says squeeze here. Squeeze this handle to fold the, the bike, the rack down. I just did this yesterday. I think I remember what it said. Um, and then the bus can't drive. If there's no bikes on the rack, the, the bus can't pull away until it's folded back up. So the drivers get annoyed if they have to hop out and fold the rack up for you. So be sure you do that. Um, biking. Biking's probably my favorite one. This is how I get around a lot of places. This is truly, if you're going to replace a car trip in Bellingham, this is the most efficient way to do it. You've got uh, the most range. Um, you're not, 
you know, st stuck to a bus schedule or bus routes. Uh, you can cover a lot more distance a lot more quickly than you can by foot. And uh, I always wheel in my bike. I don't have it with me today, um, but I show people my panniers on the back of my bike. I'm sure you've all seen them. Lots of people have them up here. But I can carry five, six bags of groceries in those two panniers when they're loaded up. I've taken a Christmas tree home on my bike. It was a smallish one, but it was still a tree. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you really can carry on your bike. And unfortunately, in this country, we don't have bike education. And, you know, if you go to school in Holland, you've had 80, 120 hours of bicycle education in elementary school. I mean, they take it seriously and they don't want people having accidents and they've got a lot of great infrastructure for cycling. We don't have that here. We have adults that tell me that they should be riding on the sidewalk or that they should be riding against traffic the way you'd walk if there wasn't a sidewalk. I mean, there's a lot of confusion about how to ride a bicycle on the streets here. And, there's, and it's for a good reason. Our infrastructure really is built for cars. As a bicyclist, you're in a bit of a gray area. And there's some things that we teach that you can do that will help. And the one thing I tell people and you know, try to hammer home is, Drive your bike the way you drive your car. You're out on the road, you're a vehicle, and you need the more you behave the way a vehicle behaves and follow the rules of the road, the better chance that drivers around you are going to know what you're doing and you're more predictable. So, you know, no driver wants to hit a bicyclist. It happens when something surprises them and they're not expecting it. You do something unexpected to them, like, swerve across a crosswalk or you know blow through a red light and when the more predictable you can be and following the rules of the road makes you more predictable the less chance of having an incident with a car so biking really is quite safe um, there's lots of ways to make it safer and this map again if you are gonna pull your bike out if I inspire you in this crummy weather and <laughs> <laughs> you still want to get out there on your bike or come spring, you want to pull your bike out of the garage and get out there and ride. Use your map. Keep this map and find some good routes because even though I want you to drive your bike the way you drive your car, it's probably not the same route you drive your car. And this is probably the biggest, the hardest thing for people who have driven to work the same way every day for five years and I come in and they're like, oh yeah, I want to start biking. And they take their same driving route on all the arterials and they have a horrible experience. It was awful. They felt like they were going to get run over. It smelled bad. It was noisy. And they don't ever want to do it again. So if you can find routes that um, help you enjoy your trip, you'll get out there on your bike so much more. So here's a good example. Who knows where this is? Anybody? Let's say it out loud. Anybody know where this is? Alabama Hill. Has anybody ridden their bike up Alabama Hill and made it without having to walk? <laughs> I don't think, I, I haven't even ridden up Alabama Hill. You could ride up Alabama Hill, or does anybody know where this is? It's the, it's the trail that connects to that um, cross. The railroad trail. So the point where this trail is sort of disappearing in the center of the picture on the right is the left-hand end of that bridge. Mm -hmm. Same spot. So this is a railroad grade trail. It's really, really gradual grade. My kids could bike up and over Alabama Hill when they were six years old. Not on the road, but on this trail. And it's lovely. It's beautiful. If you look on the north side of the map, it's the big U shape that comes out around. And yes, it is longer and it's further distance-wise, but time-wise, if you've got to get off your bike and push it up Alabama Hill on the, the road, it's going to take you quite a while to do that. So you might as well get, out, get off the road, ride the trail. You can end up at Blowdale Donovan. You can end up, this runs basically from Hagen's up and over the hill to Blowdale Donovan. And there's so many people that live right up on that hill and that whole area or Silver Beach area of Bellingham that don't even know this trail exists. And they just assume they'd have to ride Alabama to get to work so they won't try it or to get downtown or to run errands. So that's, that's the, the frustrating thing about my job is that there are so many options. We don't have to build 
separated bike lanes for people to be able to get out and ride. There's lots of places you can get out and ride right now on the infrastructure that's already built. And educating people is um, more bang for your buck, actually, than you know, the cost for me to come in and teach people or for people to get educated through even door-to-door a door-to-door program, which we did in uh, one-third of Bellingham, changes more trips than just striping a bike lane or putting in the infrastructure that it takes to um, make people feel safe. This is something else. So who knows where this is? Anybody? By Trader Joe's? Yep, James Street. James Street, it's two lanes of traffic in each direction, pretty narrow lanes, cars parked on the side. Look at, there's a, lots of intersections that don't have lights, um, lots of driveways in and out of uh, all the businesses along the street. It's a kind of hairy place to bike. It's not pleasant at all. And this is the road I would, I would drive down to get to work. Um, but does anybody know where that is? One street over. One street over is Iron Street, and you, that parallels all the way down. Um, you can get, I live over in the Barclay area where they're building the new movie theater, and I, I work downtown, 2.2 mile bike ride. I can do it in 11 minutes if I'm late and really riding fast, but you know, it's less than a 15 minute bike ride in general. I'm not on an arterial the entire way. I'm on streets like this. It's a lovely ride. I can zone out. Well, I don't zone out too much. I'll tell you why I don't do that. But, you know, it's not like I'm gripping the handlebars and feeling like I'm going to get creamed any second by a ton of traffic. It's quiet. There's squirrels. I got to pet a pig yesterday riding to work. I, I never would have stopped my car and gotten out of my car, but I'm biking along and like, oh, that dog is really sad looking. And then I looked again, and it's a lady walking a pig on a harness. <laughs> her name was Calamity, and she was 10 months old, and she grunted at me when I scratched her, and she was all happy to see me. It was a riot. So, I mean, those kind of things happen when you get out of your car and you aren't driving everywhere. Um, so, and it was on a neighborhood street like this. Yeah. What's that? So Iron Street's not marked on here. It might be marked on the other side. There, there right there. Iron. It's oh, just really I know, faded. Oh, it's not. No, no, no. I oh, think it's here, but it's not. Yeah, it's, um, they chose Grant. Is that one Grant? I see, okay. Grant on your map is the blue route that's chosen because Grant now has a blinking crosswalk across Alabama. So it, I do ride Grant Street. I could ride Iron, but Grant Street gets me. I come out right behind the high school, and then I can ride the little trail around behind the tennis courts, and then I'm pretty much downtown, and I haven't been on an arterial yet. So um, yeah, Grant isn't marked as one of the preferred routes, but you know, the point is it's one block away from all the mess of uh, James Street. Um, <coughs> I really stress that bicycling is basically as dangerous as you make it. Um, less than 25% of bike crashes even involve a car, and half of these are biker at fault. So if you follow the rules of the road, you've, just doing that will cut out half your chance of having a crash with a car. Um, the vast majority of crashes that do happen with a car happen at intersections. And so intersections are the one place where we really talk about the most. And we try to get people to really pay attention at intersections, be visible, be predictable by following the, the traffic patterns, and make eye contact with drivers. And that is really, really key. You want to be sure if there's a car waiting to pull out in an intersection, you want to, and you've got the right of way in front of them, you want to be sure they've seen you. And the only way you can do that is by making eye contact with the driver. So be sure you're really riding cautiously through the intersections. And, you know, if you biked out, I don't know, has anybody gone out to Northwest Soccer Fields or out Northwest, out along some busy road? You've got a whole bike lane. The cars are passing you 45, 50 miles an hour. And it feels really unnerving when those cars are flying past you. And that provokes the most fear of newer cyclists. And statistically, in that situation, you're really quite safe. Very few cyclists just get mowed down from behind by a car passing them. Most accidents happen at the intersections. 
And we have to remember that only 25%, less than 25% of crashes even happen with a car. So cycling is really quite safe. Um, per hour of exposure, it's equal to uh, your chances of getting in a car crash. But nobody says, oh, don't drive. It's too, too dangerous. You might get in an accident. Um, but lots of people say, oh, don't bike. It's too dangerous. You might get hit by a car. So you, know, you really have to start looking at what the realities are and the dangers really are and, and weigh it. And you know, what's the number one killer of women? Anybody know? Heart disease, exactly. Heart disease is the number one killer of women. If you get out and ride your bike 15 minutes to work and 15 minutes home, guess what that does to my risk of heart disease? It plummets. I mean, my risk of dying of heart disease is so much higher than my risk of getting hit and killed by a car, but yet that's what people just focus in on. And it keeps them from doing some of these really healthy, active things that will you know, make, them, make them healthier. Um, so lane positioning, that's one thing that is really hard for people, including adults. Um, this is a tough one for the kids to wrap their brains around when I'm in a seventh grade class. But who could tell me what's wrong if you took the line that the red, the guy in red is doing? What's wrong with that? It could look like, okay, so the car, the car in front is parked. The car at the top is parked. People are walking on the sidewalk. You've got one lane of moving vehicles. Yeah, it would look like that. Anything else? Anybody else see something? Yeah. If the parked car was pulling out. If the parked car was pulling out, you wouldn't, yeah, you wouldn't be very visible to somebody in that parked car. So there's two other things. Anybody else have a guess? Yeah. That could be. I hope motorists don't expect you to ride on the sidewalk. <laughs> But I'll just tell you. So the, the guy in red is, he's, A, he's being really unpredictable. So to the driver coming up behind him, who might be zoning out and is just not really paying attention, didn't really even see him because he's over there hugging the curb, and all of a sudden this biker comes into his line of vision, and he doesn't know what this, the biker, the red guy, is going to do. Is he crossing the street? Is he going to make a left-hand turn at the next light? Is he you know, this bike to him looks like it's just flying out in front of him. So he might slam on his brakes or swerve into the other lane. I mean, you can cause an accident by being really un unpredictable as a bicyclist. Um, the other thing is, is that in the red, he's really close to that parked car. What happens when somebody gets out of a parked car and there's a bicycle riding by? Anybody? You get doored. That's in 25 years. So I've been biking for over 25 years including a year and a half long bike trip around the world, all kinds of crazy traffic, wrong side of the road, you name it. I've had one incident with a car and it was getting doored. So you don't ever want to bike within three feet of a parked car. So this guy in the red is A, being unpredictable and he's also leaving himself open to getting doored by that car and he's less visible if there is somebody in that car wanting to get out or wanting to pull out. Um, in the green, that guy is holding a really steady line. He's not weaving in and out of parked cars. He, he, the driver knows what he's doing, and he's more visible to that driver. He's already in that driver's um, view, in the sight line that that driver's looking along. So yes, he's, pretty, he's closer to the car than he is to the curb, and that's not where people intuitively want to ride their bicycle. But if you look at it, you can see it is the safer way to go. So moving, giving yourself space on the road and moving out into traffic a little bit as a bicyclist, if it slows down traffic a little bit, you know, hey, guess what? You have every right to be there too. And um, you know, now that Portland and Seattle have really been upping their bicycle numbers, it's all shown that it lessens traffic accidents for cars as well. People do start to slow down. That's not a bad thing. That's OK. Um, so what's wrong with this? The cyclist, both the cars are going in the way the arrows are pointing, two lanes of traffic the other way. The bike's going in the right direction, but what's wrong about that? Anybody have an idea? You should be in front of the car. The car should be behind it or 
Well, sort of. You're going the right direction. This is where it's sometimes ta safest to take the lane and where you just take the whole lane and make the cars, force the cars to go completely around you. At that top one, where he's hugging the curb right there, he's really giving the impression to the car coming up behind him that there's room enough for you to pass me. There's okay. It's okay. There's enough room for all of us. But really, it's, there's not. That, that's really dangerous. That car is too close. Cars shouldn't pass um, closer than three feet. Cars should all give three feet when you're driving around. Cyclists, give them three feet. And um, there's, there's just not three feet there. So it's perfectly legal for him to take the whole lane. The car has to move over. And it's really surprising how, what the effect that is on drivers. As, as you move out into the lane, they kind of have to deal with you. And so they deal with you better than thinking, oh, there's, you know, you're right on the other side of that white line. You're right next to the curb. And they think there's plenty of room. They don't move that steering wheel at all. They just come right by really close. But if you're on the other side of the fog line, all of a sudden they have to do something and they'll give you more room. They give you extra room. It's, it's weird, but it does work. I've been biking enough to know. <laughs> so um, you can take the lane. And then this one, what's, what's going to happen here? Here he's going to get doored. Yeah. And he's not very visible from car A. Um, but it, 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 the lanes are a little bit wider here. So as long as he gives himself three feet, um, you, don't, you, know, you don't maybe have to take the whole lane. It's your call as a cyclist. But um, keeping a little bit further from the car forces car B to go around. And when they maneuver around, they give you more room. It just keeps you safer. You sort of have to build your own room around you on the street a little bit. Car doors are bigger than you think, OK? So this one's always surprising to the kids when they see it. But you know that car is parked where it should be parked. The guy's in a bike lane, a striped bike lane. And look, that's not an SUV or a huge Hummer or anything big. That's just a regular four-door sedan. And that's how far the car door comes out. So give yourself three feet away from, from doors. It really, it'll pay off. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I do now. Um, and then the other thing that you really do want to keep um, really ultra aware of is a right hook. And this is the one where bikers really lose out. Um, this one, a lot of drivers aren't cyclists. And this is something that will become um, safer as we get more cyclists on the road, then more drivers are also cyclists. And they know what to expect. But a lot of drivers who are not cyclists don't, don't judge how fast a bike is really moving. So they think, oh, I've got plenty of time to pass that bike and make my right hand turn. And they pass the bike. The bike's moving faster than they think. They put on their brakes to make their turn. And suddenly, everybody's at the same spot at the same time. So this is um, the League of American Cyclists is now uh, suggesting that you take the lane before intersections like this. Um, you know, it's your call when you're riding if you want to move out into the lane and totally block that car so that car can't come up on your your left hand side and cut you off. Um, I often will, if I'm at a, you know, you'd think people would know it's a freeway on ramp. I'm a cyclist. I'm probably not going to get on the freeway. <laughs> but I have to ride across that on ramp. And it's a little bit sketchy because people are already starting to go fast. I'll often you know, look back and I'll kind of point down. I'll just say, I'm going to stay right here and move out a little bit. So it's really clear. The more predictable you can be to cars, the safer you're going to be. Yeah. I mean, there's no bike there, just mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, because I'm going to be turning. Um, the bike lane, it, it is a lane of travel. You're not legally supposed to drive in the bike lane at all. Um, but... This would be, like, right before a turn. That way, there's mm -hmm. no risk of the... Well, if you've got your blinkers on and you're not cutting off a cyclist, I mean, that's the main thing. If there's no biker in the bike lane, it's, you know, you're not, I would say, no harm so, done. Can I answer this? Yeah. I'm just I've talked to the police about mm -hmm. this, and you're not supposed to, like, like Kristen said, you're not supposed to cross over. Yeah. To me, that seems like the freaking most safest thing to do. This freaks, I know lots of, uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. I need to sound like the people you're trying to. <laughs> 
the other, another, another issue is that, uh, is that because of distracted driving, which we don't mm -hmm. condone or anything, yeah. but the other danger with this, besides this obvious danger, is what happens with the car behind. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we've had a disastrous case with yep. little pedestrians going across the street. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not just unique to, but it's, it's yeah. smart trips. And it's, yeah. it's almost like you're saying that the drivers actually just need to be educated or have the experience themselves mm -hmm. and they'll understand. Well, yeah, but that's your chance of having that happen is so <laughs> slim. <laughs> <laughs> if I could get every driver in Whatcom County out on a bicycle for a day, I would love it. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, I wish drivers would even think about, you know, every biker that they see downtown that makes them tap the brakes so they don't run them over is leaving a parking space for them. You know, every time I ride my bike downtown, I'm not taking up a parking space. You know, every time I bike anywhere, Trader Joe's, where the parking is awful and you can't even park your bike. <laughs> um, you know, I'm leaving parking spaces for the drivers. I'm freeing up road space. Every time I ride my bike someplace, I'm actually freeing up road space because I'm sharing the road with cars. So it's, um, it is frustrating. I wish we had better education for sharing the road. And I do wish we had better infrastructure. And the more cyclists we get out on the road, the more drivers are cyclists, the more drivers are used to driving around cyclists. And what I'd love to see is enough cyclists out there to provide some peer pressure on other cyclists to not bike the wrong way on a one-way street, to not blow through stop signs downtown, to, you know, to set a good example as a rider. To be visible. To be visible. Where, where lighter clothing, lights, especially. Lights, the yeah. Having lights, lights in this weather. Mm -hmm. Especially in this kind of weather. Yeah. So if a car is coming up and they're in the zone and it's gray and you're not wearing anything particularly bright, but you've got a light on, it's yeah. flashing, yeah. that catches their attention. Yep. Yeah. Someone's yeah. here and they're going to turn, they're, they're not going to just look around there because right. they're and I, cut, I really didn't want to just talk about biking for you know, the whole hour because that's, you know, we're supposed to talk about all of the modes. But um, this is the one that promotes, provokes the most discussion. And probably as you, know, you guys ride the bus, you know how to do that. I don't know, need to talk for 20 minutes about that. But um, the, just keeping um, the next slide, what I was going to say was the next slide I have is how to avoid, if this happens, um, you can also just turn with the car. So forget about going straight. If I see somebody pass me and they've got their blinker on, I just assume they have totally misjudged my speed and they're going to cut me off. So if they've got their blinker on, I just put the brakes on. I just stop. And there have been times where a car pulls ahead of me on my left, they've got their, their blinker on, we're coming to the intersection, and I just stop, and they stop, and they look at me like, well, go, I'm waiting for you. And I'm saying, well, go, you're about to run me over. You know, so be, be really aware. And the other thing, when people don't use their turn signals, look at their front right-hand tire. As soon as that tire isn't parallel with the car anymore, you can see they're turning right. So watch tires, just be really aware. Don't assume somebody's going to use their turn signal. And, and if it happens and that car is coming in on you, be ready to just turn right. Just turn right around the curb with the, your, with the car. And setting yourself up, if you're hugging the curb, if you're right on that right dotted line to the right of the cyclist, if you're hugging the curb, you're going to have to pull a, a real 90 degree angle to turn with the car. But if you, you're out a little bit and you're on the other dotted line and the car still turns with you, you've got a, a wider turning radius. So not hugging the curb really does set you up to be able to avoid a right hook better, too. So that's uh, the right hook. And the other thing to keep in mind, blind spots. So everybody knows about blind spots behind a car. The, this area, let's just pretend this red car is parked and you've got two lanes of traffic. That blue car passed you two, three blocks away, and you've just been riding along at about the same pace as traffic. You could be in that blind spot for two or three blocks. That car's completely forgotten you're there, and they're going to turn right, and they don't use their blinker, and you know you just have to be really aware of that. So you have to be, you just have to be a lot more defensive when you're riding in traffic. That 
you know, something like that can happen. So be aware that you could be in their blind spot. This is something, nobody knows what this is. Anybody know what this is a diagram of? I don't think anybody's gotten this one yet. First person, very good. So it's um, they call them pillar blind spots, or you know the A. There's A pillars and B pillars in the back, but the pillars are the four things that hold up the roof of the car. And these pillars, the reason I put this in is because these pillars are getting bigger because they're putting airbags in them. The front corner airbag is now in that front A pillar, and so when a driver is sitting there in that blue car and looking to the right. It's a pretty big blind spot, and it's a very vertical blind spot. As a cyclist, you fit in that really well. So what I was talking about before is make eye contact. If you're coming along as a cyclist, you're coming along where those two cars are at the top, and you look and you try to make eye contact, and nobody and you can't see that person's eyes, don't bike in front of them. They, you're in that blind spot, and they will pull out. It actually happened to me with a police car. He was sitting at a stop sign. I had the right of way. I could see, I couldn't see his eyes at all, so I put on the brakes, he started to go, and then he saw me, because then I wasn't in the blind spot anymore, he slammed on the brakes and rolled down his window and said he was so sorry, and I'm like, you know, that's okay. <laughs> but, um, so it happens, thanks, it happens easily. Um, we won't go into this too much, this is, um, if you're riding your bike, you can't set off the light. Uh, get on one of these cuts in the pavement. It's a metal sensor, and you're, they are all set to be sensitive enough by, to be set off by bicyclist. Um, a lot of people think it's a weight thing, and they're tapping their tire, or they're turning their, their they think it's a sensor from the light, but that will uh, trigger the light to turn green for you. Um, remember, only 25% of bike crashes even involve a car. 45% of all bike crashes are caused by one thing. Anybody have an idea? It's Pilot error, just falling off your bike. So 45% of crashes. We all get on our bike and we're terrified of the traffic, terrified of the cars. Nobody gets on their bike and rides out of the driveway thinking, oh my god, I might fall. So um, be really, just be aware when you're riding your bike. Uh, starting out, go for an easy ride with neighborhood or around your neighborhood. Come to one of our bike classes. Everybody Bike has a bike class every uh, month. A few more in the summertime. They're really great. Um, get your bike out of the garage. Uh, if you don't have a bike, get a bike that really fits you. My, my bike, I mean, my, I had one I was, I had over 20,000 miles on one bike. I mean, I had it for 12 years. I don't know my last commuter bike, how many miles I had on it, but they last a long time. So don't cheap out. Don't get one at Walmart or Kmart. When those break, they really aren't very fixable. Um, Earl's Bike Shop on Meridian has great consignment bikes. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. And then we do also have carpooling for smart trips, getting back to the whole um, beginning. Uh, walk, bike, bus, or ride share. Um, we talk the least about ride share just because it's, it's one of the hardest. Um, you've got to live near somebody. You've got to work near somebody. You've got to have them want to go at the same time you go. It's great when you get a carpool set up. It can work out really well for some people for years. Um, we just find in our jobs that you can work really hard to get carpool set up and people will stick with them and as soon as a shift changes or somebody's kids need to be picked up at a different time, it falls apart and you haven't really changed the person's behavior. You know, if you guys get out there and ride your bikes, start riding your bikes places, or when you came to Western and you got your free bus pass, you started taking the bus, that was a true durable behavior change. You started riding the bus. You stopped driving, you didn't even have your car here, so now you're riding the bus everywhere. If you keep driving just with somebody else, it's a slight behavior change, but it's not very durable because so many things can um, come up that stops you from doing it. You could ride the bus anywhere in any city you go to. Um, so carpooling is just a little bit harder to keep going, and we don't consider it as durable behavior change. So are there any questions about the program, about encouraging people about being encouraged yourself. Use the maps. The, the, those maps actually have every bus stop on them. The little pink dots are the actual bus stops, so that might be useful. So, Great. Well,